as you're able, please rise for the call to worship and the processional hymn. Come to worship the one who is, who was, and is to come. Let us worship the ruler of the kings of the earth. Come to worship Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, good shepherd, and true voice. Let us worship the wonderful counselor, Prince of Peace. Come, let us worship the King of kings and Lord of lords. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Come, let us worship.
everyone. Good morning. Good morning. I hope you all had a happy Thanksgiving with family and friends. It is a joy to be here in worship with you, whether you're here today or whether you're listening on the radio. It truly is a joy to see you. And I invite you now to share signs of peace with, with the people next to you. May the peace of Christ be with you. Will you join with me in the prayer of confession? When we have missed the mark as your children and have trusted in the things of this world far more than you, we pray for your mercy. When we have forgotten to consider the needs of others and have chosen not to love our neighbors as ourselves, we pray for your mercy. When we have neglected to pursue your will and have placed our will above yours, we pray for your mercy. Beloved friends, hear the good news. God's mercies are new every morning. The love of God never fails to reach us when we need it the most. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen.
The first scripture this morning comes from the Old Testament book of Isaiah in the 61st chapter. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners. And the second scripture this morning comes from the New Testament gospel of John in the 18th verse, 18th chapter, 33rd verse, and is set following Jesus' arrest when he was brought before Pilate. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and other chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went out and to the Jews again, and he told them, I find no case against him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Throughout the Gospels, we hear how Jesus explicitly welcomed the children unto him. And in that same spirit, we welcome the children down for children's time. Come on down. Children are always welcome to stay with us in the worship service, but for those who might like it, uh, we have uh, immediately following this children's time enrichment for ages four through fifth grade. So come on down. So today is a special Sunday. Not only is it the last Sunday or the, the Sunday after Thanksgiving, it's the last Sunday in our whole calendar year for the church. We have a slightly different calendar year than the rest of the calendar year. And we try through that year to tell the whole story of Jesus, starting from when he's a baby, through when, he's, when he lives and teaches, through the crucifixion and the resurrection and all of those pieces. We try and tell the whole story, but it always ends the last Sunday of the year with something we call Christ the King Sunday. It's looking for that time when Christ is finally the king. So I'm wondering, what does a king have to have? What does a king have to have? A crown. Good. Okay. So we've got a crown. Right? So some kings wear funny robes, so this is kind of a funny robe here. All right, what do you think, Ethan? A queen. Yeah, that would be helpful, too. Yes, yes. Leadership, I think that's a pretty important one. There's kind of another group of people, right, that a, a king needs in order to be a king, don't you think? What, what's that area? Knight. You need some knights, some people are willing to help, that's true. What do you think, Max? Yeah, there's a citizenship, right? There's people out here. I would say you kind of need a kingdom, right? You need a whole group of people who are willing to follow. But the funny thing is, Jesus is not your typical kind of king, right? We don't really see him wearing a crown. We hear about them making fun of him, putting a crown of thorns on his head. But we don't see a big golden crown. And there's not a huge kingdom out there that he's ruling over, setting up laws. He has just one law for us, that we love one another, right? That's what we hear, that that's one law that we have, and then we all have to follow that, and that makes us part of his kingdom, right? Well, here's the thing. Jesus also said eventually that we become the body of Christ, so it means that we're kind of the kings, too, and that we are not asked to rule over people, but to rule with people, to teach them that command and to keep passing on that command, and I like to think that Jesus gives us a crown, but it's not quite a small crown. It's a pretty big crown that we have to wear, right? Like this is the crown that Jesus gives us and it's a crown to grow into because none of us are quite big enough to wear the real crown that Jesus has. But if we keep him as our king and we stay here and we try and think about what can we do to live into that vision that he has for us, that vision of a world in which we all love God and we love our neighbor as ourselves, then maybe, just maybe, we will understand what that kingdom of God is all about. We'll finally understand what it means to have Christ as the king. And so in the meantime, all of us have a crown to grow into and a vision for a world that we might try our very best to keep growing tall enough to wear. Can we do that? This is a crown I keep in my office. And I look over and it reminds me of what Jesus has called me to do. It's just to keep trying to grow tall enough to wear it. So can we give thanks to God as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread 
and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right, thanks, friends. pray. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be both pleasing and acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Two truths and a lie. A popular icebreaker that many of us have played, one that is not reserved for a particular age group or type of person. It's the kind of icebreaker that gets you thinking, allows you room to get creative, and it forces you to participate. To my fellow introverts, I'm sorry. But for those of you who haven't played it, it goes a little something like this. You gather in a room with other people. Each person goes around the room one at a time and shares three pieces of information about themselves. Two truths and one lie. Everyone else in the room then gets to guess which ones are true and which one isn't. It's a fun game. Sometimes comical pieces of information are shared, but other times it does get more serious. The point, though, is to be creative because you don't want it to be too easy, of course. But the objective is simply to get to know the people around you, something we should all desire to do. But don't worry, I'm not going to quiz you on how well you know your neighbor in here. But I did just give you a way to break the ice in the gathering center after service. <laughs> Now, the interesting thing about this game is that we pretty much always use concrete facts or surface details when playing. For example, if I told you, I am a Jersey girl born and raised, I have visited three countries in Africa, and I am the youngest of five children, the concrete facts are that I am the youngest of five children, and I am a Jersey girl born and raised. 
While I have visited two countries in Africa, saying that I have been to three is in fact a lie. But friends, I wonder how complex the game would become if we started to use subjective truths instead. Things would probably get tricky because the truth would be open to interpretation. In order for one thing to be true, something else would have to be false, and suddenly, we'd have to consider perception, emotion, experience, and so much more in order to arrive at some kind of conclusion. And even then, as we all take turns at guessing the truth from the lie, the reality is what's true for me might not be true for you. That's why it's subjective or open to interpretation. And while it might turn a 20-minute icebreaker into a day-long workshop, I presume we'd learn a lot more about the people around us if we allowed it to get that real. Now, don't get me wrong, the concrete facts speak to the reality of who we are, but so do those things that are open to interpretation, those things that we believe that others do not, those things that we sort of keep to ourselves for fear of judgment or debate, those things that we ponder silently about life, about this world, about scripture, and even about our neighbors. Here's an example. One might say, Rochester is the greatest place to live. Church is a place we come to, to experience safety and freedom. And if you work hard enough, you can become anything you want to be. Now, I know we all love Rochester in this freezing cold weather. Church is, for many of us, a second home, and we've all worked extremely hard to get to where we are. But that might not be the case for everyone you ask. It might not even be true for all of us in here. Because, you see, society doesn't make it possible for hard work to be enough. And church hasn't always been safe and salvific for those who didn't quite fit in. And according to news reports, friends, Rochester is one of the hardest places to live for people of color and others in poverty. You see, suddenly what we thought was an easy game of two truths and a lie becomes a bit more complicated. <clears throat> Why? Because the truth for me might not be the truth for you. So what then is truth? And it's this question, my friends, that stares back at us from the pages of Scripture in the last verse of our reading for this morning. What is truth? It's a question that has been widely debated across professions, cultures, and generations. It's a question that everybody asks, but nobody really answers. And it's a question that even in the context of this scripture never really gets the attention that it deserves. And as I consider the sometimes subjective nature of this thing called truth, I'm led to ask a completely different question. Whose truth? Because again, if we all take turns at guessing the truth from the lie the reality is, What's true for me might not be true for you. But even with that being the case, that doesn't mean we shouldn't share it. Earlier this year, upon receiving her Golden Globe Award for Lifetime Achievement, and in delivering her acceptance speech, Oprah Winfrey declared that speaking your truth is the most powerful tool we all have. And that doesn't mean your truth is better than my truth or my truth more meaningful than yours, but it does mean that our individual experiences, feelings, perceptions, and stories matter. Our truths are our truths for a reason, and we should all feel compelled to tell them. 
The challenge, however, is to not stop there. If we do, friends, we risk getting so caught up in our own experiences that we neglect to consider anyone else's. If we do, we risk making our truth the only truth and in turn turning a blind eye to everyone else's. You see, in asking whose truth, we create space. Too often, conversations about truth turn into arguments about who has the most compelling theory or who has the power to actually make their theory heard. And the reality is oftentimes by failing to ask whose truth, we silence and we leave out so many. But when we ask this question, we create space for somebody else's story and for their experience to be lifted. Because in the case of Jesus, who you ask about his ministry makes a difference. It is true that many hated him, mocked him, and despised him. But it was just as true that many were grateful for him and benefited greatly from his ministry. But we didn't get to hear their side. But see, this isn't unfamiliar to us even today. When it comes to issues of law and order in this society, policy change and governmental decisions, too often the people with the megaphone magnify one side of the debate while those who have been affected most by the systems go unheard. And it's the perspective of those not written into our dialogue today in our text that I'm concerned about because there are entire groups of people whose truths about Jesus make a difference, yet they aren't even asked. What about the blind who now see, the sick and afflicted who are now healed, the caged and secluded who are now free, the outcast and written off who are now seen and included? Or what about the woman with the issue of blood, the blind man at the pool of Bethesda, the troubled man living among the tombs, the Samaritan woman at the well, the Jairuses whose children are healed, the Lazarus who got another chance at life, and the ones whose stories we've never even heard. But also, what about those of us in here today? Maybe once brokenhearted, but now whole lonely but now loved, poor but now on our way to wealth, ignored and silenced but now heard, friendless but now a part of a loving community, hopeless but now graced with the hope of our faith forgotten, but now remembered and cared for by God and each other. What a difference it would make if we dared to just ask that question not just what is truth, but whose truth. But friends, maybe we, like Pilate, haven't asked because we aren't ready to hear the answer. Because you see, by inviting the perspectives of others, by asking those around us to share their truth, we take a risk. We risk hearing that perhaps the way we see things isn't the same for everyone. We risk having to acknowledge that not only our opinions matter in life. We risk hearing that our truths about Rochester, church, and success aren't shared by all. And friends, we risk having to actually do something with what we've heard. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners. When we dare to ask whose truth, we risk having to actually do something with it. Perhaps Pilate asks Jesus what is truth and then turns to walk away before receiving an answer because he, like the others in the story, know that the response is one they might not be ready to accept. That in the case of Jesus, truth is twofold. 
First, it is a call, and then it is a response. The call is to become a participant in Christ's kingdom, and the necessary response is to bring good news and to proclaim liberty to those who need it. Friends, that is the message of the gospel, the mission of Christ's followers, and the necessary truth of it all. Necessary not because it's comfortable or easy, but necessary because it's what we have all been called to do. And in the case of Jesus, this is what it means to remember Christ as king. As I heard one preacher so powerfully state, when we think of Christ as king, we don't end up with the definition of nobility we were expecting. Instead, we end up with an itinerant farm boy preacher from the hills who washes feet. A king who publicly tortured for speaking truth to power does not back down from that truth. A noble king who lifted up on the cross draws all people to himself that they might be reconciled to God and to one another. A king who restores light and life where there is despair and desolation, a king the word made flesh who says to all of us, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. And so friends, we return to our game. But this time, we call it two truths and a choice. We imagine two pieces of information that we know and believe to be true and we offer a choice that we all need to make. Rochester is a diverse city with varying positive and negative experiences. Asbury First is a church that strives to create safe and salvific space for all who come. And together, we will do our best to share Christ's truth by creating pathways of success and access to all who need it. Friends, Advent season is near. And as we anticipate all that it will bring, may we be compelled to share that necessary truth. That in the case of Christ, we've accepted this call and will respond by making a choice to bring the good news and to proclaim liberty to all who need it. May we always create space by raising the question, whose truth? and then doing something about it. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, this was a week that reminded us to be thankful in the midst of incessant in-laws, thankfulness. In the midst of onerous offspring, thankfulness. In the midst of patronizing parents, thankfulness. In the midst of loneliness and loss, thankfulness. We confess that it is not always easy to be thankful, but it is important to be reminded of the importance of seeking out this thankfulness in our lives. It is too easy to remain focused on the arguments, the ghosting, the negativity, the self-destruction. Instead, may we be reminded this week and all weeks to spend more time focused on thankfulness and as we look ahead, we find ourselves on the precipice of Advent, of weeks of hope, love, joy, and peace. May we continue to embrace these traits. May we find hope in our broken relationships, 
share in love during unwanted diagnoses, renew joy in our mundane routines, and experience the peace of God in all things. This season of our church year can be filled with great highs and deep lows as we prepare for the roller coaster of emotions and experiences in the weeks to come. Let us not forget the gospel truths that we are beloved children of God, that we have a church family that loves and supports us, and that we are called to extend God's grace and love to everyone we meet, to our family and friends, to the clerk who is trying their best to get through their shift, to the driver who just wants to make it home before dark, and let us not forget to extend the same grace and love to ourselves. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. If you are visiting with us this morning, we want to take this moment to extend you a special welcome. We're really glad that you're here. Asbury First is not a perfect place, but we recognize that we're more perfect with you than we are without you. So we'd invite you to join us in our mission to love God and neighbor, to live fully, to serve all, and then to do it all over again until we get it right. We'd also invite you to join us in our uh, ritual of friendship by signing that red tablet, which you'll find towards the center of your aisle. We'd ask everyone sign it that we might recognize your presence among us this morning. You may also want to keep it open that you might learn the names of those who are seated around you. Speaking of which, you may just want to, after the service, reach out a hand, meet someone new, take a moment to engage with someone else here in this moment. It takes a lot to step in the doors of a church. Take a moment to let them know you're glad that they're here. Whether this is your first Sunday or your 90th, we are really glad that you're here among us this morning. We also, for those who have noticed others wearing name tags, we have those for you if you would like one. Simply go to the welcome desk or go online and we'll have one ready for you within just a couple of weeks. There are many, many ways to get involved within the life of the congregation. Many of those ways are printed here in your bulletin, but more are printed on the hearts and minds of the people around you. Don't hesitate to ask if there's something you're wondering about. We would love to help you find that next step in. You may notice that we have several things happening in this Advent season from a Star Wars class that is a one night only this Wednesday evening, just having some conversation about those theological themes in that uh, class. Good it is. Mm. Yes, yeah, it should be very good. <laughs> we hope you'll join us for that. It should be a very fun evening. And then beyond that, we have from caroling around the Christmas tree and having some cocoa to participating in our meditative service to coming and walking the labyrinth to taking that next step into the life of this congregation. We hope that you might use Advent as a time to engage and to take that next step into this congregation and into life together. With that said, we consider in this moment all that God has given to us as we give something back to God as the ushers wait on us for our morning tithes and offering.
God of all our yesterdays, our todays, and our tomorrows, we bring our hearts, our gifts, and our desires to be a part of your love revolution in this world. We dedicate our gifts and our hearts to shaping a world with love, that we might embody the love you so freely gave for each of us. Amen. prepare to leave this place, I challenge all of us to embrace that necessary truth that calls us to be participants in Christ's kingdom and to respond by going out and sharing the good news and proclaiming liberty to all who need it. And as we go, I pray that the peace of Christ would be with you today, tomorrow, and forevermore. Amen. Beautiful.